Hello and welcome to our Kitty University's BI 327 Histology course uh, series of lectures on the male reproductive system. As with all of these lectures, um, please review the objectives that are provided at the beginning of both the lecture and on the web page because it gives you an idea of what are uh, kind of the important concepts associated with the lecture as well as provides you with an opportunity if you're interested to use these as study focusing questions. Now, if we take a look at the male reproductive tract, uh, what we're going to see is essentially uh, one primary structure, the testes, which is going to be involved with uh, the formation of the uh, sperm cells, germ cells, essentially uh, for reproduction, uh, as well as a, a variety of hormones, uh, essentially primarily testosterone, uh, which is going to be both regulating the development of the, the, the spermatozoa, uh, the sperm cells, as well as uh, regulating the activity of a variety of other structures associated with the male reproductive tract. And so we're going to have production of the sperm cells, production of testosterone, and then uh, a variety of other structures that are going to be present. They're going to be involved with the either the storage or the delivery uh, of the sperm cells during the process uh, of reproduction. So we're going to have structures within the, the testes. Uh, we're going to have structures which are going to be excretory duct system uh, for delivering uh, the sperm cells from the testes uh, outside of that, uh, as well as a series of accessory glands, uh, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the vulvo-urethral glands, which again are involved with essentially priming the system and helping to deliver functional spermatozoa uh, into the female reproductive system. We'll also talk very briefly uh, about the penile structure uh, at the end as a, a structure involved with delivering uh, spermatozoa during internal fertilization. Now, the focus in on the ma uh, majority of the structures, uh, majority of the function associated with this is going to be uh, the testes. And so the testes are going to be the male gonads, and in essence, they're going to run parallel to the ovaries that we just finished talking about within the female reproductive system. Now, the testes are located in the scrotum. They're essentially located in a, a skin of, a uh, flap of skin kind of outside of the body because uh, they're susceptible to increased body temperature. Uh, and so they're not going to function properly if they're housed within the body. So they can be housed outside of the body within uh, the scrotum um, in order to be able to be maintained at a temperature where they can work. Now the testes themselves have two main roles. Uh, you can think about the first role as being an exocrine type function. Uh, in this case, the, the exocrine product is going to be the sperm cells, the spermatozoa. So we're going to have seminiferous tubules. They're going to be specialized structures involved with production of sperm cells. And then those sperm cells are going to be transported, like we would see with an exocrine product, they're going to be transported through a duct system. And so you can think about it as being roughly parallel to what we've talked about with other areas of exocrine secretion. So here we have a duct system uh, involved. We're also going to have an endocrine uh, function associated with the testes. And the endocrine, uh, as we've talked about before, Endocrine secretion is going to be hormonal secretion, uh, secretion without a duct system. And so we're going to be looking at interstitial cells, uh, often referred to as Leydig cells, which are going to be involved with producing the steroid hormone testosterone. So if we take a look at the testes themselves as an organ, uh, the testes is going to be uh, located uh, within the tunica vaginalis. This is a double layered mesothelial sac, which is going to be covering the anterior surface of the uh, of the testes. If we go down beneath that, we're going to see a dense fibrous connected tissue, tunica albuginea. So similar to the tunica albuginea that we saw surrounding uh, the ovaries in the previous lecture series. Um, and then if we take a look at the testes, we're going to see that it, it's going to look very different from the ovaries in that we're going to have walls of the tunica albuginea, which are essentially going to extend down dense connected tissue septae which are going to extend down into the testes itself and divide it into about 250 different lobules. And within each one of those lobules, we're going to have some loose connective tissue and then anywhere from about one to four seminiferous tubules. And so we can see that again on the diagram uh, to the upper right, as well as the histological image to the bottom right. Now the seminiferous tubules are going to be a stratified seminiferous epithelium. So it's going to be a stratified epithelium and the cells are going to be differentiated very different from the epithelial cells that we've seen previously. And they're going to extend from that basal lamina, which is going to be referred to as the tunica propria, uh, in this case as a distinct boundary, 
uh, up and to the lumen. And now within the seminiferous tubules, we're going to have two lineages of cells, two types of cells are going to be present. We're going to see spermatogenic cells, and these are going to be cells that are capable of dividing and producing mature sperm cells, spermatozoa, as well as a variety or essentially a class of supportive cells that are going to be present to support and nourish the development of the spermatogenic cells. Now, I keep skipping slides. Um, so if we take a look at this, again, we're going to be looking at this as an epithelia, and so it's going to be sitting upon a basal lamina. If we look at an electron microscopy or a basement membrane, if we're looking at it in light microscopy, but essentially, like we've seen in other types of uh, epithelia, stratified epithelia, we're going to go from relatively undifferentiated cells near the base to highly differentiated cells up towards the, the surface. And so this is going to be the same thing here. The spermatogenic cells, the first cells are going to be the spermatogonia. These are going to be round cells. They're going to be sitting upon the basal lamina. And these are going to be the least differentiated of the cells. They're going to look very similar to normal body cells. They're going to have a round nucleus, a relatively patchy pattern of heterochromatin within the nucleus. And these cells are going to be, in essence, stem cells. And so these are cells that are going to be able to divide. But the important thing to recognize is spermatogonia are going to divide through mitosis, divide through the process that all of the other cells in the body are going to be dividing through. And so spermatogonia divide, and they're going to give new cells, but these cells are going to be uh, still diploid. They're still going to have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, so we're going to have some cells that can differentiate as well as maintaining a stem cell population. Now, some of those cells that are produced by the spermatogonia are going to become spermatocytes. And so they're in essence going to be pushed up into the epithelium. And as they're pushed up into the epithelium, they're going to start to differentiate. So the primary spermatocytes are going to be the largest of the germ cells that are going to be present. The largest of the cells are going to be coming to the sperm cells. And they're going to be characterized by it being very large. They're going to have a large round nucleus. And they're going to have dark strands of heterochromatin within them. They're going to have often a stringy appearance to the nuclei. Uh, and the reason for that is that these cells are going to be going through meiosis I. And so many of these cells are going to be recognized as being in prophase of meiosis I, or in some cases in meiosis themselves. So actually see the chromosomes and see the chromosomes dividing. Now, the secondary spermatocytes are going to be very difficult to identify in a histological specimen, uh, because the secondary spermatocyte basically is going to be in meiosis II. And so these are going to be the products of meiosis I. And so if you remember from genetics, meiosis I, we're going to be looking at haploid for chromosome number, but still diploid for DNA amount, because we're basically halfway through this process of meiosis. Now, the secondary spermatocytes are going to be very rare in histological section, because basically meiosis II is going to occur immediately after meiosis I, and it's going to be completed very quickly. And so these cells are going to spend a very short period of time in meiosis II, and so we're really not going to be able to identify secondary spermatocytes within our seminiferous uh, epithelium. But what we're going to be able to see is the products of that. The products of meiosis II are going to be haploid for both chromosome number and haploid for DNA content. And so what we're going to be looking at are going to be referred to as spermatids. And so what the spermatids then are, are going to be haploid cells, they're going to be germ cells, but they're not going to look like mature sperm cells yet because they still have to go through a process of differentiation, which is going to be referred to as spermiogenesis. Where we're going to take a relatively round, undifferentiated cell, which is haploid, but prepare it for its function as a mature functioning sperm cell. And so what's going to happen in that process of spermiogenesis is we're going to take a relatively generic round cell and we're going to streamline it for delivering the DNA to the egg to allow fertilization to occur. And so we're going to look at specialization of the spermatids in this process of spermiogenesis, where we're going to have condensation of the DNA. So it's going to be packed within the head region. We're going to see mitochondria within a spiral collar. And so that's going to be important because we're going to need a lot of ATP energy to power the flagella, essentially the tail that's going to be developing. And then ultimately, we're going to have an acrosome formation. An acrosome is going to be, in essence, this uh, kind of cap-like region. You can hear the, kind of this, this greenish region uh, through here, which is going to be packed with enzymes. So they're going to allow it to 
uh, essentially digest its way through and penetrate its way through the outer covering around the ova. And so it can penetrate through and allow delivery of the DNA to the egg cell and allow fertilization to occur. And so ultimately what we're going to end up with are going to be spermatozoa, which are going to be in the lumen. And they're identified by the arrows in the diagram to the right, where they're located by the lumen, recognized by the fact that they've got the long flagella that are going to be present. Uh, so they're essentially there, they look mature, but they're not capable of forward motility and they're not capable of fertilization at this point. They still need to be primed and activated uh, as they're being stored and delivered into the female reproductive tract. Now, if we leave the sperm cells for a little while, we go back to the uh, support cells, we're going to see the Sertoli cells. This is the second category of cells within the seminiferous epithelium. The first were the spermatogenic cells, the cells that gave us the functioning sperm cells. The Sertoli cells are going to be the supportive cells. These are going to be elongated pyramidal cells that are going to be sitting upon the basal lamina. They're going to extend all the way from the basal lamina to the luminal surface, but they're essentially going to establish the entire structure of that seminiferous epithelium. They're going to have large, pale, kind of ovoid nuclei, and essentially they're going to be surrounding and supporting all of the developing sperm cell. And in doing so, they're going to establish occluding junctions between the cells. They're going to essentially establish a barrier between the cells, which is going to be important because they're going to, in essence, provide physical support for the spermatogenic cells. They're going to phagocytize the shedded material as we go from a, a round, undifferentiated cell to a mature-looking uh, sperm cell. They're going to be involved with uh, secretion of antigen-binding protein, ABP, which is going to help uh, testosterone be transported throughout the body. But they're also going to establish the blood testes barrier. And so if you take a look at this, the Sertoli cells are seven on this diagram to the right. You can see this extension and the boundary point at eight, where two Sertoli cells come together. They're essentially going to establish a barrier so that these developing sperm cells at the luminal surface, kind of closer to the lumen, uh, which are going to start to look different. They're going to start to essentially express different proteins than other cells within the body. And so we don't want them to be triggering an immune response. And so this blood testis barrier established by the Sertoli cells are going to protect the developing sperm cells from an autoimmune attack. Now, outside of the seminiferous epithelium, essentially in the connective tissue between them, we're going to see some interstitial cells, or often referred to as Leydig cells. These are going to be relatively pale cells, maybe slightly acidophilic, in the connective tissue between the seminiferous tubules. Large nuclei, uh, one to two uh, nucleoli, they're going to be present. And these are the cells that are going to respond to luteinizing hormone uh, that's secreted by the pituitary and secrete testosterone. And that testosterone is going to be important because it stimulates the development and activity of all of the other cells in the testes and the accessory tubes, uh, duct systems, and the accessory glands. And this finishes up our discussion of the testes. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Uh, in the next series of lectures, we're going to look at what happens to the sperm cells as they're released from the seminiferous tubules essentially transported through the duct system to the excretory ducts and uh, essentially what's occurring within the, the anatomical structures uh, for that process. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.